Hey everybody, Haku here with my last read-through video uh, for the second half, really just the epilogue. Uh, Mahou Shoujo Ikseike Kaku or Magical Girl Raising Project, Joker's Chapter 6, The Magical Girl Hunt. We're going to read the epilogue now. Sorry I didn't have a video last week. Uh, I canceled both of my read-throughs last week because I was sick and had a sore throat and I was like, I cannot make it through an hour of recording with a sore throat. Um, so yeah, I canceled my read-throughs last week, so sorry about that. And next week we might not have a Magical Girl Raising Project video either, but I'm not sure. Next, or the next video I'm doing on it before I go into the next arc is that I'm going to do a re-updated version of my favorite characters to now include characters from Limited and from, um, oh gosh, what was I thinking? From Limited and from uh, Jokers. Because I think the last time I did one was after I read episodes. I think I did one after I read uh, Unmarked, then one after I did episodes to include the restart characters, and now I'm going to do another one to include the uh, Jokers and Limited characters. So that'll be next video. I don't know if it'll be next week or the week after next though, because a video like that I'm going to have to take notes on it. I'm going to have to get videos or pictures to put in the video, uh, and it's going to take a lot more recording and editing than a usual one does. So because of that, uh, it might not be next week just because it might need a little bit longer to put in the work to work on it. Um, so if it's not up next week, it'll be up th or Tuesday after that. So, uh, yeah, I guess that was all I had to say. Uh, lots of sadness going on. We ended at kind of an interesting place where Snow White is seemingly trapped. I wonder if we'll get to figure out what happened there, or if that's going to be put off until next arc um, as sort of a cliffhangery type thing. Uh, we also have Shufflin and... Uh, Shufflin and What's-Her-Face still alive. Uh, Shufflin and uh, Grimhard are still alive. And also, Deluge escaped and Filaru seemingly died, which I think is overkill, but eh, it, it's whatever. Um, the, I feel like so far, I'm going to read this before I really judge it, but just some thoughts going in. I'm going to do plenty of discussion afterward, hopefully, but just some thoughts going in. I think that, like, Restart is like a 1 million out of 10 arc. It's amazing. And then, um, for Unmarked, it's like an 8 or 9 out of 10, and this is also, to me, like an 8 or 9 out of 10, but for totally different reasons. Uh, the reasons I like this are more for the storyline that it has going and for, like, really good villains carrying it. And the emotion and character weight and development, I think, is better than Unmarked. Uh, and I can't complain too much, because as much as I want arcs to be like Unmarked or Restart, I like that every single arc is really different from each other. And as for Limited, I know people like it and stuff. For me, it's like, if I forgot the ending ever existed, maybe like a 6 out of 10. It's pretty okay, but not as good as the other arcs. But the ending was pretty abysmal, and that to me drops it to like a 2 to 4 out of 10. Um, but yeah, so... That's my thoughts on it so far, but I'll discuss it more afterward. Also, this is going to take a lot of reading, so it's probably going to be kind of a long video, uh, but hopefully I'll have plenty of time to discuss it afterward. Either way, let's get into reading. We're starting at the epilogue, which is, if you're reading, uh, at least for me, from the uh, drive, it's page 32. Okay, let's start at the epilogue. Mar Mar Marco Mark is alive, but Marco Fukuroi parked her car in front of the Buddhist store parking lot. Okay, I'm going to be kind of pissed. I hope Marika's alive, but I, I thought she died. But this is Mariko Fukuroi. I'm going to be so pissed if it's just somebody who looks really similar to Marika, and it's like, oh no, this is Mariko Fukuroi. Either way, or maybe that's a typo, I don't know. Mariko Fukuroi parked her, parked her car in front of the Buddhist store parking lot. Their Buddhist, or their Buddhist store just by the... I, maybe they mean there's a there's a Buddha store just by the temple, and you could buy flowers there. That's why she came, but when she did, there was no Buddha store. There was a supermarket nearby and another flower shop there. Normally, she'd use the neighboring flower shop. They'd line up plants side by side on a wider scale than the mass retailers. Also, the employees would know her botanist nature and give her a free pass. Not, or not to mention, they'd give her various kinds of deals as well, since she was such a flower maniac that she'd order flowers from overseas. Even though she wasn't able to order much from them if there was some kind of problem, like the running water being quarantined, she still found that store useful. 
The florist shop that she visited today wasn't that big of a shop. The nearby supermarket was exerting its influence, but maybe she could still buy some funeral flowers here. There was a graveyard nearby after all. Perhaps I'm already starting to get feelsy. I feel the tear tears welling up because it's reminding me of the end of Restart, which like killed me. There was a graveyard nearby after all. Perhaps due to its small scale operation, they only had a few varieties that they had or er, that they handled. But all she needed were flowers for the funeral. She'd choose the most beautiful buds, then take it to the checkout counter. Welcome. Thank you for your service. The clerk was strangely friendly. College part time or a college student part timer, someone who lived on part time jobs. He had brown hair and piercings throughout his body. In one word, he looked very chaotic. Well, it's better to have a sociable, chaotic worker than nothing. Hey, lady, is this for research or something? Wait, how did he or how did he know? Marika wondered before realizing that she was still wearing her white lab coat. She thought or she thought vainly that white coated suits would look quite formal. When she was a human, she always dressed in these clothes. But no one who goes to funerals wears white coats like these. Embarrassed, she took it off and folded it. Yeah, maybe. I think I'd be able, to, or I think I'd be able to do with some of these. You're a scientist. You're still quite young, aren't you, lady? Huh? Oh, I'm not that young. Yeah, you are. You don't look that old. Your skin's, or your skin's still beautiful. You really are a beauty. Nice hair too. Where do you usually shop? You live in the big city, don't you? Marika look, er, Mariko looked at the clerk's hand. He was just preparing the flowers with the white paper bag. But why was he taking so long? Was he putting ribbons on it too? Scientist, huh? Yeah. Mariko repositioned her glasses with her right hand. When she did something like this, it me means her mood was getting worse. She cleared her throat. I love, er, I love him, you know. Smart woman? I'm not that smart. So you gonna experiment on these? Huh? On what? Flowers. Why on earth would she experiment on funeral flowers? No, not on them. Ah, I get it. I see. It's for something else. Sure, yeah. Visiting a boyfriend's grave? Huh? It's kind of sad. Clack. Her heel sounded out. She felt more annoyed than when she adjusted her glasses. Mariko knew, her, knew herself better than anyone. She seemed, er, she seemed only intelligent due to her appearance and behavior. But intelligence, that's what people would call it, was not something that could describe her. There was only so many people who could provoke her true nature as Mariko Fukuroi, her violent, impulsive, emotional nature. As Mariko, she can keep her cool, but can, er, but can also socialize. That's why she can hide herself. But this guy. she just met him, and what's more, she was a bit ashamed at being provoked by such a low-leveled man who flirted casually in a store. Maupam would probably scold her for that, but sometimes even high-class establishments would do that too. She was hit on just the other day. Just how much was she able to take? She was already ashamed at wearing a white lab coat to visit a gravesite. But that's sort of dramatic too, you know? Really now. I really do dig you. Oh, do you? Um, <laughs> Marco getting more and more pissed. Uh, my shift's almost over. Wanna grab lunch and dinner together? There's a nice restaurant nearby. It's got entertainment too. Look, you gotta move on from your losses. Meet someone new. Mariko got angry. Things would get very serious. Very, very serious. She'd rather keep her social outcast status to her magical girl self. I wonder if Marika Fukuroi's real name is Mariko Fukuroi, and that's why it's spelled like this now. Um, in order to not get angry, she would just tend to leave whoever's making her angry alone. But this time, she grabbed the nape of the clerk's neck and pulled him close before whispering, If your shift's almost over, better actually start working, huh, mister? She thrusted the clerk forward as if to push him, then brought all the flowers toward herself. The clerk kept quiet. Marco hur hurriedly left, with a smile on her face, flowers in hand. Maupam would tell her to just spend her whole life as a magical girl if she could, to decrease the time spent as human, to forget its sensations, and to continue raising her own magical girl potential. Doing that will lead her to greater heights. That sounds very Maupam-like. Uh, she doesn't think about the magical girls who weren't always filled with er, filled with battle every single waking moment of their life. She talked everything based on herself. There was no exception. As Mariko er, as Marika Fukuroi, okay, fighting was an instinct was an instinct. But as Mariko Fukuroi, she'd record a general er, she'd record a flower's germination time, effects, and various other things. 
as Mariko she would study. In turn, this will make it easier for Marika Fukuroi to fight. It was like she was one person in a one-legged race. That's right, one person. There was a second, but now she was alone. She wondered what magical girls like Marika Fukuroi were thinking in the same position. Mariko would probably refuse Marika's offer. Despite hating it, that girl always followed along while being dragged by Marika. She was the one supporting her as Marika, more than Mariko could support herself. Even someone who fought as though they would never die, or even someone who fought as if they would never die was near death. Marika Fukuroi lost consciousness in the middle of that battle, but has she ever done that often in the past? When she woke up, she was on a bed. She had been told that the magical girl Hunter came back to rescue her, which surprised her. She also heard that Shufflin and Grimhard had gotten into an accident and died. It seemed they were trying to seal off their involvement. It was more likely that they escaped, but her hope of a rematch was also destroyed with that, which made Marika cranky. If Mimi were here, she'd say, you're not a child anymore. Mariko gripped the funeral flower strongly. She unlocked the car. She placed the bag of the flowers in the passenger seat and adjusted her glasses with her right hand. I am so happy that Marika lived, because her death was one of the hardest for me, and I don't think it ruins it for her to still be alive. I am so happy she lived, because I felt like her and Prism Cherry both had a lot more reason to live than die. It felt kind of weird that they all just died there. Mimi had a really good death, though. That was really well written. I'm going to grab some water before continuing. We're currently at page 36. Okay. Now we have Human Resources, Nanako-san. Uh, paperwork level high, actual work level low. Ever since the attack on Fle's house, the Human Resources division has had a slow work week, meaning less paperwork that's due. Most of the divisions trying to see if they're safe enough to continue working again, and it doesn't help that the examination division is closely monitoring everything there. Still, that means more time to relax, and more time to spend or to spend some bonding with family. Nanako-san brewed some coffee, and she headed toward the living room. There, her guests were eagerly, wa er, were eagerly waiting while watching a movie, Mana and Tepsukembe. Mana had fully recovered and was on her feet again. Actually, since the examination division would like to investigate almost every potential member of the Human Resources Division, Mana's volunteered to be Nanako-san's supervisor. Mana knew Nanako-san er, personally, so it was easier for her to talk with Nanako-san, and Nanako-san felt a bit more calm with Mana, watching her house instead of some other Examination Division magical girl. Coffee, said, er, asked Nanako-san as she came in with a tray. Thanks, said Mana with a smile. The three of them sat down and watched, and watched the movie, eating snacks and drinking coffee. It was a crime drama movie, typical action movie where the hero saves the day, gets the girl, and probably with some bits and pieces thrown in. For some reason, Mana really liked those kinds of movies. It wasn't really anything groundbreaking, but Tepsukembe watched intently. She studied almost every word that the characters were saying, mouthing it every time. Tepsukembe had mostly learned how to emote from TV shows. She learned new words from there, and she learned how to express herself from there. After the movie was done, Mana left the kitchen to wash her hands, while Nanako-san began cleaning up the table. With Mana gone, Nanako-san could be more at ease with expressing herself. She was worried. Worried for the future. Worried for Tepsukembe. Worried for what will happen to the trio. But she didn't want to show that worry to Mana, because showing that worry would mean Mana would probe further. Mana didn't deserve that after losing her sister. Tepsukembe, she could, er, Tepsukembe she could be more open to. Tepsuke may not might not understand the subtleties of Nanako-san being worried, since Mei was very straightforward about everything. But it looks like Nanako-san may have underestimated, er, underestimated Mei's empathy. Tepsuke may grab Nanako-san's shoulders, and with the most serious expression she could muster up, Nanako-san, you need to be more firm. You need to be more confident. Oh, what is, er, what's all this? said Nanako-san, chuckling. Mei will always be by your side. You need to be confident in what you do said Tepsukembe. Nanako-san had no idea if Tepsukembe was being serious or if she was practicing a line from a movie where the supporting character backs up the main character. Either way, Nanako-san knew that Tepsukembe was serious about one thing, her intent. Then they heard a snort and some laughter from behind them. Mana had been watching the whole time. How long were you there? Pfft, long enough. Sorry, sorry. Hey, Mei, 
You said you wanted to show me your garden, right? They made a secret base. Ah, huh, that's cool, show me. Tepsikeme rushed out. Nanako-san could tell that Tepsikeme was happy. She spent all week making a nest from her garden, where she would probably hide out in the day, playing in the tunnels underground or just around the garden. Tepsikeme had also learned how to plant trees. She studied it in one of her days and took interest in, and took interest in that. You guys have fun out there. I'm going to do the dishes a bit, okay? Nanako-san will come outside after? asked Tepsikeme. Don't worry, May. Go show Mana your stuff, said Nanako-san. Tepsikeme nodded and dragged Mana outside. Nanako-san saw from the window that Tepsikeme and Mana were having a good time. She turned on the faucet and picked up a sponge and began cleaning the cup. Like this, she heard Mana say from outside, planting a tree with some dirt on her face. Tepsikeme nodded. Mana followed her instructions carefully. Tepsikeme showed Mana the various holes and tunnels that Tepsikeme created. Mana was treating Tepsikeme like her little sister. Mana hadn't smiled or laughed since Hana died, so it's great that she could move on. Tepsikeme also got a supportive friend and was able to learn more social interactions. She's getting better at emoting, and she's getting better at expressing herself. Training with Mana would be the best course of action for Tepsikeme. Nanako-san, meanwhile, had her own problems. She scanned the sponge. Apparently it was imported from Germany. Huh, the more you know. Nanako-san would scan things sometimes, just to keep her mind off bigger things at hand. Knowing short little details made her mind wander. Or made her mind wander. She still couldn't scan herself, since she can't exactly see herself, and mirrors don't work as she'll only scan the mirror instead. Her boss, Fle, had been under house arrest. If the examination division finds out that Fle sent her to work with Pithy Frederica, not even Nanako-san knew the extent, or... Or who knows what will happen. Not even Nanako-san knew the extent of what the teamwork with Frederica implied. It's not the first time she ever teamed up with her, but she hated every second of it. Be more firm. Maybe she should. She had a family now. She had the closest thing she had to a close circle of friends. Mana and Tepsikeme were the closest thing she had as family. She still wanted to know what happened in B-City, especially the parts that she wasn't involved in. She wanted to know where Ripple was, why her body was never found. For that, Fly needed to cooperate, as she was certain that she knew more than she had let out, or let out on. S-City was different. Nanako-san was never part of that incident, but something similar must have happened. She had heard reports that two magical girls had been arrested, but during their transfer to the Land of Magic prison, an accident hit the transport. The accident was so huge that no bodies were found, and it's assumed all involved had died. Okay, so they, they have to totally be alive. Died. Really. Nanako-san wasn't sure of that. Magical girls don't die in accidents. Then again, the train crash inside B-City killed a close friend of Nanako-san. The Namiyama High School girls were family. Nanako-san would always remember them. She didn't spend a lot of time with them, but they were heroes nonetheless. And Nanako-san will carry on their memory until the day she dies, which reminded her of something. She had a guest upstairs. She arrived last week and was picked up by the Land of Magic after a distress call was sent to S-City. Nanako-san brewed a cup of coffee and went upstairs. There she saw her, sitting emotionless, staring off into the distance, not at anything in particular either. She's been like this ever since she arrived last week, an empty shell of a girl, Princess Deluge. She'd lost all her friends, too, and she hasn't been taking it well. Normally, a magical girl's mental state can always handle heavy losses due to the increased stability, but Deluge wasn't exactly a normal magical girl. Man-made magical girl. Nanako-san had no idea what that even meant. Mana had even tried a spell to calm her down, still she reacted the same way. Eating, bathing, sleeping, that was all Deluge did in Nanako-san's house, and every time she did it, there wasn't exactly any emotion either. The scary part is that if Deluge had moved on, and her mind's no longer reeling from the shock, that means Deluge is acting completely rationally. Nanako-san sat next to Deluge, offering her coffee. So I heard you met Snow White. She's kind of like you, you know. She became a magical girl when she was in middle school or two. Or when she was in middle school too, said Nanako-san with a smile. No response. Do you know where Halbert has a name? It's Ruler. I think it's someone from her selection test. Did you name your weapon? asked Nanako-san. No response. You know, even though you're all quiet, you still managed to keep yourself in shape. That's a good thing, said Nanako-san. No response. Delusha's eyes were unreadable. Scanning her revealed she was perfectly fine. That's what always scared Nanako-san. 
what's going on in this girl's head. Well, if you need me, just call me, okay? No response. Nanaka-san placed a coffee cup on the table, took a deep breath, and walked downstairs. All right. I feel like that scene did more for Limited than most of Limited did for Limited. I love that. That was really, really good. I mean, I take a quick jump cut, though, because my lighting's getting weird. I need to go uh, fix something really quick. Okay, sorry about that. Had to fix something with one of my lights. Now let's continue. We got Shadow Gale toward the end of page 42. Uh, Shadow Gale. Mamori Totoyama was reading the newspapers. Really, all she could read are newspapers. Seven newspapers come every day to the Hitokuji Manor. Each newspaper, co er, each newspaper covers and focuses on different things, usually. Some were sports-focused, some were gossip, some were actual world news. Sometimes newspapers would cover the same story, but from two different perspectives. Mamori always found that interesting. Mamori never really read much of the news. There was only one reason why she's reading so much news these past few days because the Hitokuji Manor was under strict supervision. Ever since Kanoe was attacked, there had been a slew of magical girls that were sent to guard the manor. The reasons were for protection. Protection. Sure if protection was the same way or sure if protection was the same way a prison guard protected a prisoner. There was clear er this was clearly a house arrest. They weren't acting like bodyguards at all. They were acting like prison guards. Electronics were confiscated, they cut off access to the internet, Mamori couldn't even play video games. Not even tablets used to read books were allowed. They're basically living in a place without access to technology, so Mamori, er, so now Mamori relies on physical entertainment. Physical books, newspapers, things like that. Mamori opened the curtains, and she saw a teenage-looking girl folding her arms, standing in guard. She was wearing a suit. She looked like a high school girl preparing for a job interview, though that's clearly a magical girl. She had a metal tiara on her face, and her suit was more on the fancy side, too, so it's a magical girl. Okay, metal tiara. Did Is this, like, in the future, and Deluge became a guard? Either way. The suit girl glanced at Mamori, and Mamori gave, gave a disgusted glance back. Then she proceeded to close the window. In response, she heard the suit girl's footsteps as she stopped by the entrance to the door. Great, she went closer. Mamori disliked all these magical girls surrounding the manor. There were about 12 or 13 of them guarding the area, and Mamori didn't have any privacy at all. Kanoe was hiding something for sure. Mamori didn't know exactly what was going on, but it's clear that Kanoe herself had done something bad. Something really, really bad. Knock, knock. Come in, said Mamori. Kanoe came in with a slew of board games. I thought you might be a bit bored, so I brought some entertainment, said Kanoe with a smile. Board games? Board games, card games, the whole bunch. You'll just win, my lady. I'm not good at these games. I picked the ones where you know the er, where you know the rules to already, at least. And how would you know that? You stalking me? You and I both know each other inside out, Mamori. True enough. Still, I don't know how far you've practiced in these games. Well, efforts should or er, should be invisible. Results should be the only thing visible, after all. Isn't that your entire philosophy? Hmm. Well then, shall we? Cards? I don't like cards. Why not? Too much luck involved. You either get good hands or bad ones. Then shogi, chess, open information, everyone starts on equal footing. You'll still win for sure. Adaptation is key to winning, Mamori. I don't expect every plan to go smoothly. And chess and shogi are the things that you clearly understand better than I do. So reverse I. Only if I move first. Very well. Advantage goes to you, Mamori. I'll warn you that advantage doesn't mean anything if your opponent can ad can adapt to your strategy. I'm playing this expecting to lose, my lady. Now, that's not good spirit at all. The board was set. The pieces were in place. Mamori made the first move with the white piece. Kanoe made the second. Mamori made the third. A good opener, Mamori. A little by the books, though. I told you, I'm not exactly good at these games. Maybe when this ban is lifted, then... You seem to be taking it quite well. You know you're not allowed to leave the manor at all, right? That's perfectly fine, Mamori. I still have school, so I'm going to have to part ways. Would you like an escort? After, er, after what we're getting here? No, thank you. Kanoe placed a stone. Mom, er, placed a stone. Mamori's pieces turned black. Mamori shrugged. What do you think about the magical girls here? Annoying. No privacy. There's nothing really that we can do about it either. Feels like we're being imprisoned. 
No matter. They can't exactly get anything out from us, nor can they hurt us. Why exactly would they want to do that? Because they'll probe, of course. Milady, I want you to understand this, but if I find out something's off and that you're doing something very wrong, hmm? I'm gonna have to do something a lot more than hit you with a wrench. That's a scary thought. A lot more. I hope it doesn't come to that then. I hope too. Just don't get carried away, please. I really love Shadow Gale. This is why she's my favorite character. Because she still has a moral compass, but at the same time, no, she shouldn't betray her friend. But at the same time, it's hilarious and still has that moral compass thing. So all that was great. Now we have Snow White on page 47. Okay, Snow White. There were no signs that it would rain, but it rained. Snow White walked in the rain anyways. She didn't have to clean her outfit. It'll just be back again if she ever detransformed. Still, your clothes and underwear being wet is uncomfortable, but it doesn't really matter. Snow White placed her halberd down on the ground, sat in the grass. Oh, what if it wasn't an accident? What if Snow White killed the two of them? I just thought about that. Oh yeah, wet grass. Uncomfortable as well. Again, it didn't matter. When Snow, White's, er, when Snow White received the message to investigate a city, she had received it from Ripple's phone. Was Ripple alive? The search will probably end with nothing at the end. Optimism's good, but it can only get you so much. Snow White really should stop involving close people with her. They never end up with good fates anyway. It's like being around her causes them to die, all because she was unable to protect herself. Times, er, times have changed, though. Okay. Now Snow White needed no one to protect her. She was perfectly capable of protecting herself. It's good for her. It's good for others. It's a good deal. They don't have to end up like Snow White's old friends. The soccer boy that promised he'd be her sword. The girl who lost her key, who cared about Snow White more than her own life. It hurts to remember them, but sometimes they float back into her memory, no matter how hard she's tried to move on. Why didn't she die? Joker and Grimheart were still alive, but for some reason she woke back at a hospital, got out and was perfectly fine. What happened after that? Snow White was completely ready to die as well, still she's alive. It means that, er, means that it's back to business with her. Find Ripple, hunt rogue, hunt rogue magical girls. Her phone rang, text message. If you want to know about the incident in that city, I have information. The name you're looking for is Flev, the Human Resources Division. If you want more information, come to the meeting spot. The attached file is a map. Come on time. Snow White took a deep breath. You're going, Pone? The meeting point is at a high school. I'll come prepared. I'm right with you, Pone. The sender accused Fle. Snow White only knew her by er only knew her by name, and only knew her as a high ranking member of the Human Resources Division. Will Fle be her next prey? Before she even thought of er before she even thought of it, she'll need more information. She'll need to understand everything beforehand. Snow White still hasn't gotten over the incident, however. There are so many things that she knew because she can't or er, because she can hear everyone's thoughts, their fears. Snow White knew that Shufflin could kill hostages to replenish herself. Shufflin didn't want anyone to know this, so Snow White picked up on it. But if Snow er, but Snow White didn't tell anyone, because she also heard Deluge and Inferno's minds. They wanted Tempest to be safe. If Snow White had told him that Tempest died, Delusion Inferno might become suicidal. They were young, new magical girls who wanted their friend safe. They had a close friend in each other, and nobody's prepared for it when a close friend dies. Snow White should know, as she herself had been stupid and reckless when that boy and that girl died. It never gets easy, but every bit of hope matters. So, Snow White chose not to tell them, even though it's disadvantageous. She chose not to tell her... She chose not to tell them how Shufflin replenishes herself because it'll give them hope. Hope is the one thing you can hold on to in a dark time like that. To prevent anyone else from suffering the same emptiness that Snow White did, she kept hope alive in Delusion Inferno. It couldn't last, but she tried to keep that torch alive as much as she could. What's wrong, Pone? It's amazing how Falk can sense Snow White's emotions, despite not having any powers of his own. Nothing. It's always nothing with you, Pone. Because it really is nothing, Fall. Well, if it's nothing, then it's got to be something to get your mind going, right? Fall was cheerful, optimistic. Fall reminded Snow White of herself. Fall's heart was happy. The only thing he worried about was Snow White and her mental state. He cared for her. Cyber fairies have emotions and feelings, despite what people tend to believe. It's not all program and data. Fall was a close friend to Snow White. Sometimes Snow White would close herself off from him, if only to protect him. 
but at the same time, she's glad that Fall's there to brighten up Snow's day. Ripple's a strong magical girl. Snow was sure that she's alive somewhere. Despite being realistic, it couldn't hurt to be optimistic as well. Snow White then heard a cry for help, the voice of someone's heart. Someone's in trouble. Well, magical girl, magical girl hunter, you ready? Always, said Snow White, smiling. She readied her halberd and left for the source of the sound. Ah, uh, man, again, a really good scene. This has been so good so far. I'm going to save again really quick so I don't lose any progress. Now we're at Shadow Gale on page 51. Kanoe Hitokoji was always by Mamori's side. When they go to school, when they're at home, they both knew where each other are. Even if Mamori fled out alone, Kanoe would know that she left, so in a sense, if Mamori wanted to do something in secret, Kanoe would know simply because Mamori made an effort to avoid Kanoe. Thanks to the unique situation that they're in, this is the first time Mamori was actually forced to be away from Kanoe, and Kanoe wouldn't, er, wouldn't think it suspicious at all. That means Mamori had to be quick. She transformed and went to the roof of the school. She waited and waited, looking at the nearby clock to find out what time it was. Oh my god, she's the one that's been talking to Snow White. Holy crap. Finally she arrived. So you're the sender, said the girl. Yes, m my name's Shadow Gale. Snow White. Long time no see, Pone. A voice popped out with a stereoscopic mascot jumping out and about. The cyber fairy was always around when Shadow Gale was in a killing game. Or this cyber fairy was always around when Shadow Gale was in a killing game. It was very uneasy for her, though she knew that not all cyber fairies are the same. This one was Fall, who helped them in the game she was in. Snow White was the magical girl hunter who apparently stopped the game's mastermind Keek a few years ago. How's it been, Fall? As good as, er, as, good as I can be, you? I'm okay, Shadow Gale trembled. Her arms were shivering, not because the building was cold. Magical girls are resistant to normal weather effects. Her body was shaking because of Snow White's eyes. It's like she's watching her every move. Was this what managed to stop Keek? They didn't, er, they didn't call her the magical girl hunter for nothing. It's as if Shadow Gale's, be, er, Shadow Gale's being watched, and any wrong move will be deadly. She stepped forward. She offered a small, shining blue ball. It looked a bit like gum, but it's too bright to be normal candy. Here, a sign of trust and a promise, said Shadow Gale. Snow White took the ball silently. What's this? It's, it's everything. Snow White looked at the ball and back at Shadow Gale. All of Ple's fan, er, all of Ple's plans, her memories, her motives, everything. Everything's in that small orb you hold. I have control of it. She entrusted it to me, so now I'm entrusting it to you. Okay, and that's what, uh, Lapis Lazuline did, um, Lapis Lazuline the third, I guess, did, uh, last time. Um, yeah, it's what she did, er, at the beginning of the arc. So I'm entrusting it to you. What do you hope to accomplish from this? Asked Snow White. Without it, she won't be able... Or without it, she won't know what to do. With it, you'll know everything she planned to do. She might be able to be stopped. But she wasn't forced to do these things. She wasn't controlled. Then why do you think removing her memories would help? If her nature is the same, she'll do the same thing again. She's right. Flo would do it again. It's in her nature. Mamori's name was made to protect her was made to protect Kanoe. This was her form of protection, protecting Kanoe from herself, stopping Fle from going further and further. Shadow Gale took a deep breath. Then you kill me. Man. Fall's image distorted. Snow White raised her eyebrow. If I die, everything Fle does will be for nothing. I'm the reason she does things for the 98 Magical Girls. Everything she does is to ensure my safety. I know, because I'd be in her position, too. The fight with Clantail in the VR game. So, if I die, Flo will stop. And she can see. She needs to see the damage she's doing. If she can't see it for herself, then she has to be forced to see. You know, I can't just kill you. Don't you get it? I'm a kill switch. If killing me makes her realize what she's doing, if killing me makes her stop, if killing me can put her back to her senses, then killing me's worth it. She could always just fake her death. Flea's capable of many ama er, of amazing things, but she has extreme tunnel vision. If Flea could even stop for just a moment and see what she's doing, then Shadow Gale was certain that Flea would have gone differently. Now, however, it's come to this. The two magical girls understood each other. The white magical girl, the black nurse. Black and white, standing on the roof, bowing down, going their separate ways. 
Okay, so this is interesting. I don't know if she's going to kill Shadow Gale or not, but this is actually a pretty good plan. I think she could just fake her death. I don't think she, like, needs to do it this way. But she knows that Fle's evil because she's protecting her, and she knows that because and she knows that without her, Fle wouldn't go the same path, but because without Fle, she would be lost and not know what path to take. And at the same time, she knows that instead of giving her her memories back of her plan, she can have Snow White stop the plan, and that will save Fle from doing illegal things. This is the way to save her. So it's actually really, really brilliant, and it was set up at the beginning. Again, this last half chapter is probably better than any of the... Well, I mean, the entire arc has been good, but this is probably the best part of the arc, is this last half chapter. Uh, so now I'm at page 55. I'm going to save really quick because my battery is getting really low and I really don't want to lose anything. Alright, now we're at Pithy Frederica. Oh, this is the first time we've seen Pithy here, yeah. Pithy doesn't collect the hair of dead magical girls. It serves no use for her. She even got rid of Clamberry's hair when she died. She can't exactly see the magical girls anymore, though she does make exceptions, like the hair of that one girl, Prism Cherry. Hair could tell you a person's life story. Prism Cherry had the most beautiful hair, but no life story to attach it to. She was a blank canvas, just like how her hair has multiple ways to view her, shining differently depending on the light source and angle. She was a blank canvas that Pithy would fill. She helped out Prism Cherry when she got attacked by Joker, pulling her inside when she was in danger. She nursed her to health, easy enough to do with the same med medicine she used to heal Ripple. Then she taught her the basics of her magical skill, changing images and mirrors, why that's merely a way of saying she changes light. She just needed the right nudge, the right push. She wanted to save her friends. She had a heroic spirit. She wanted to go back. There were better ways to save them. Pithy could honestly pull them all here, however that would be too suspicious and Snow White would probably notice. So Pithy allowed Cherry to go back. She saw Cherry's story unfold, a hero to the very end. Sadly, not strong enough to survive, but her heart was pure. And now she's gone, but her hair lives on, as her legend and story continues in the heart of Pithy Frederica. Honestly, it would have been cool if Pithy pulled her back through and healed her again, and then just started collecting her super team of magical girls like Riffle and, uh, like Riffle and Prism Cherry. But either way. Ah, but then of course there's the ideal magical girl herself, Snow White. How she's grown. Pithy had once, er, once again seen her, as she's become different than before. She's grown herself, without Pithy's guidance, but still growing into the ideal magical girl. Pithy actually plans for Snow White to face off against Fle, to use Fle as food for Snow White's growth. What a climactic battle that would be. However, her plans were ruined when Shadow, when Shadow Gale went ahead and gave Snow White something that could hamper Fle's plans. Fle entrusted Shadow Gale with those things, but did Fle really not antici anticipate Shadow Gale to betray her? Either she does, or she put too much trust in her to be called servant. Maybe Fle is just galaxy-brained right now, and she knew that if she made this fake evil plan and gave the memories to Shadow Gale, she would give them to Snow White, meaning that the plan would be stopped and the good guys would win at the end. What if Fle is just absolutely galaxy-brained right now? So yeah, either she does, or she put too much trust in her servant. The door opened. A one-armed ninja was at the doorway, smiling. Ripple had recovered and was back in her ninja outfit. Ah, good as new. You like it? Your original costume suits you, though. I will miss dear Stunt Chica. What happened? Ah, uh, yes. Pithy erased all memories of Stunt Chica from Ripple just to be safe. And of course, I kind of guessed it because she threw the knives at that one time when she stopped shuffling. And that's pretty much Ripple's power. I kind of wish Stunt Chica was just Stunt Chica, though. But either way... Just a costume change, and of course, I lem well, I guess Stunt Chica really was just Stunt Chica, because Ripple didn't have any of her memories when she was Stunt Chica, and now she's lost her memories of being Stunt Chica. So Stunt Chica was her own person, actually. She was Ripple's body, but she didn't have any of Ripple's memories, and Ripple doesn't have any of Stunt Chica's memories. So she was kind of her own separate person, but still the same person. That's actually kind of a crazy concept. Uh, just a costume change, and of course, I lent my left hand as well. We were both busy during that time. We created the perfect show. A magical girl show for everyone. Ah, oh, sounds fun. 
It should be. You had so much fun prancing around. Clowns couldn't, er, clowns shouldn't be sad after all. But you, my dear Ripple, are the best at being you. Did I do a good job? You did an amazing job. Now, you're going to do some more amazing things, okay? Okay, whatever you say, Ripple said with a grin. This isn't the end yet. With things developing like this, the Land of Magic's about to feel the fallout from the events of S-City. Sides are being drawn, and people are switching factions left and right. For this, Pithy really needs to be prepared for the next step. Okay, so this was really, really good. It put into context so many things we had already seen, and is generally really, really, really good. So I gotta say, I already really, really liked the arc, but I would say that this, just this epilogue, pushes it so much higher for me. Again, I would still probably say 9 out of 10. It's about on the same level as Unmarked. Both are really, really amazing, but both are amazing for totally different reasons. Like, for Unmarked, it's more the characters. For this, it's more the storyline. And they both had just so much good about them. So, uh, yeah, I absolutely love Jokers. Uh... Once I bring back the high Q&As, I'm sure we'll discuss it a lot when I talk about stuff from the comments. I can talk to you in the comments a bunch here. I don't exactly have a ton of time because of the battery not being able to record a video this long anymore um, very well. But, uh, yeah, I absolutely loved reading this arc. If you want me to do a discussion video at some point, I can. I feel like that's something you're interested in. My next video, though, like I said... Maybe if I don't, maybe I'll do a discussion video next week and that'll give me extra time to the week after be able to work on a video on the updated characters. Actually, I think I'll do that. So uh, either way, discussion video next week, I guess. I just planned it here. Uh, like, if you did like the video, comment down there. Tell me what you thought of this video or what you thought of my, or what you thought of this chapter, what you thought of my thoughts on it. Subscribe for more Magical Girl Raising Project, much more on the chat, or much more on the channel. So yeah, next up's the discussion, then the characters updated, then the reactions to the next arc character designs, and then I'll start reading the next arc uh, week by week. So uh, yeah, that's it. Like, comment, subscribe. Follow on Twitter if you want. I can try to keep you updated there and stuff for the channel or talk to you there. And if you want to link to our Discord server to talk to me or more of us on Discord about this series or anything else, just ask and I can give you a link. That's it. Thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.